seminar on policing and mental health. Um, my name is Madeline Motter and I'm with the League of Women Voters and I'm your moderator for tonight. And so our format will be each speaker will talk about their background and experience and then respond to a general question. And then specific questions will be asked of each speaker later. The last 20 minutes of the seminar, listener questions will be answered. Uh, so why don't we get started without further delay? I want to introduce our three speakers tonight. Kareen Chapman is the Executive Director of Vermont Psychiatric Survivors, an independent statewide organization run by and for psychiatric survivors. Their mission is to provide advocacy and mutual support that seeks to end psychiatric coercion, op uh, oppression, and discrimination. Founded in 1983, the organization offers patient representation in Vermont psychiatric hospitals and residential facilities and sponsors peer-led support groups, among many other programs that we'll hear about tonight. Welcome, Karen. Th welcome. And our other speakers are, well, is A.J. Rubin. He's a supervising attorney at Disability Rights Vermont for the past 18 years. Disability Good. Rights Vermont is a private nonprofit organization and designated as Vermont's national protection and advocacy system. Their mission is to promote the equality, mm -hmm. dignity, and self-determination of people with disabilities. They have many important initiatives that we'll be hearing about tonight. Welcome, AJ. Next is Brian Pete. He's the newly sworn chief of police in Mount Pelier, where he leads a staff of 27, which includes officers, regional emergency dispatch personnel, and administrators in service of a daytime city population of over 20,000. Previously, he served as the chief for the Alamo Gordo Police Department in New Mexico. And I'm hoping he's gonna talk about his work in New Mexico on establishing a crisis intervention team training program. Thank you, Chief Pete, for being here. I know you're probably a busy guy right now. Thanks very much. So let's get started. The first year from Kareem Chapman from Vermont Psychiatric Survivors. Kareem, could you please tell us about your professional background and what has been your experience with police interventions with people experiencing a mental health crisis? Absolutely. Well, I want to first say thank you uh, for this great opportunity uh, to share a little bit of me um, to your group. And you guys have been doing some great work out there. Um, my connection to this work and what I do um, as a young man, uh, my father was killed by police. Um, while I was on my way to meet him, <clears throat> it was a mistaken identity. Um, that made me a very angry kid. Uh, and I began to make a lot of bad choices. Um, and the system in New York thought the best way to handle that was to medicate me and to um, give me the miracle pill, <laughs> so to speak, to make things go away. Well, that didn't work. Um, I pretty much got into more trouble and made more mistakes in my life. Um, but the speed, you know, forward, I, I was eventually able to get together with mentors and peers and um, some great family support. And I began to rebuild the community that I once destroyed. Um, I started my own nonprofit. I ran the first gun violence program in Harlem, New York um, that was funded by the mayor. Um, and I also began to work with um, women who were misplaced, young people who were misplaced. Um, I did a lot of work with police officers, um, organizations around the, the whole state, really. Um, and to speed up ahead to today, <clears throat> like she said, I'm currently the new executive director for VPS. Um, and I've been doing this work for about six months for the job. Um, before that, I worked uh, for Rutland Mental Health for about two years where I was the, their first peer specialist. Um, and I actually created that program and it went well and we were able to help people to not um, go back into the hospitals. Uh, my interaction with police um, has been some good ones and some bad ones. I will say that I do have friends with police um, and I do, I can also say that there's a lot of work to be done um, as it pertains to police relations with people in the community. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Kareem. 
Uh, next, let's hear from AJ Rubin from Disability Rights Vermont. Could you talk about your professional background and what has been your experience with or understanding of concerns about police interventions with people experiencing a mental health crisis in, in Vermont? All right, well, thank you again. Um, as Kareem said, thank you so much for the work that League of Women Voters do. And thank you for all the people who are watching us tonight and for your interest. And um, my background is I, um, I went to law school here in Vermont. I, my first job was I was the lawyer for the Abenaki Indian Nation of Missisquoi um, for Homer St. Francis. So it's always important to start these things with a recognition of the land. Um, you know, we're in a place in the world right now where we're talking about truth and reconciliation yeah. uh, moving forward uh, with accountability. And so it's always important to remember sort of the, the first issue here, which is the indigenous people. Um, then I was a public defender in Rutland for nine years. And, and for the last 18, I've been here um, working at Disability Rights Vermont. And we do a lot of work with, um, with police. And, you know, again, because of the time we're at, um, I got to just say to, to, to Chief Pete, who I'm meeting for the first time tonight, um, you know, thank you and, and, and the goddess bless you and all the, the police who are actually protecting us uh, from people who would, who would do us harm. You know, and, and that's an important thing to acknowledge that, that police are crucial to, to stop people from hurting other people. And that's what's going on right now. And in Montpelier this week and next week, there's a lot of fear. Uh, and, and we, um, you know, our, my, my prayers go out to, to Chief Pete and all the other officers who are gonna be involved in protecting us over the next week. And at the same time, it's important to, to note that- Montpelier is- it's, at the same time, it's important to note that what we saw at the Capitol building this week was, was some law enforcement officers um, doing harm to, uh, to the people and democracy. Um, and it was a real wake up call for, for white folks that you know, sometimes the, the police will, will be against you even though they're sworn to serve. Um, and you know, that's something that people from disenfranchised communities, black you know, BIPOC people and people with disabilities, They've, they know that from a long history of, of being on the wrong end of the police baton. Um, but we really saw that and it, it just underscores the importance of policing and the importance of having police that are faithful to, to the society they're supposed to protect and don't have an agenda that is oppressive. The last thing I wanna say before we move on is that um, I have a, a real fondness for the idea of universal precautions. And that when we talk about policing and people with mental health conditions, what we really want to be focusing is on is universal precautions so that it's not um, uh, putting people in boxes and having different practices for every box, but it's universally making sure that the system works for all people, no matter who's coming to the door. And the same way that curb cuts for people who use wheelchairs are, you know, are helpful to the rest of us when we're walking around downtown Montpelier, if we're pushing something, you know, with wheels that it, it, and baby strollers and everything, it helps us. The same thing goes for policing. If, if we use universal precautions so the police don't use unnecessary force against people with disabilities, this will help all people and, and, and raise our, our civilization, our community together. So it's not really about putting people in boxes. It's about universal precautions to make sure everyone is equally served and protected in our society. And I really look forward to the conversation. Thank you for your time. Well, I really like that idea of universal precautions. I hope you elaborate more on that uh, later in the show. Um, so I wanna thank you, AJ. And our next speaker is uh, Chief Pete. And if you could talk about your professional background and what has been your experience with or your understanding of concerns about police interventions with people experiencing a mental health crisis. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm, it's really uh, a, a privilege and an honor to be here uh, with everyone today. Uh, briefly about my background, I started off as a commissioned officer in the Air Force uh, as a aircraft maintenance. And then after 9-11, I was cross-trained into the Office of Special Investigations, which is a, uh, the Air Force's version of the FBI and the NCIS. So as a special agent, I was the assistant uh, 
detachment commander in uh, Nellis Air Force Base in Las Vegas. Uh, I deployed to uh, Afghanistan for Operation Enduring Freedom. I came back, did some more time at Nellis, and then went to Langley Air Force Base as the regional manager for operations enhancement for the second field investigations regions would include the Middle East, uh, other areas in Southwest Asia, South America, continental United States. Um, uh, so our our, board, our our charge there was to make sure that uh, we we um, to oversee criminal and counterintelligence counterterrorism investigations and operations. Um, after uh, leaving the Air Force, I joined the Chicago Police Department. I worked on the west side of the city of Chicago, and then I also served as a field training officer, and then in the fusion center um, for the department. Uh, I, I did that for roughly 10 years, uh, married late, uh, became a father at a later age. And then uh, when my daughter was born, we uh, I, I left the police department uh, looking to relocate and I joined JP Morgan Chase to work in um, uh, anti-money laundering and know your client operations. Uh, I did that for roughly a year, then transitioned over to the city of Chicago inspector general's office as a chief investigator. And then when the DOJ consent decree came down for the Chicago police department, I became the chief forensic audit investigator responsible for police accountability. Uh, after doing that for roughly a year, um, I then, um, transitioned over to, uh, uh, as the chief of police in Alamogordo, New Mexico, and worked there for roughly a year and a half, and then um, came here to Montpelier, uh, where I'm currently working now. So, um, you know, as I understand this, CIT um, and working with folks of mental, uh, uh, who are dealing with mental health crisis, is extremely important to me. Uh, my my uh, master's degree is in counseling psychology, or in police psychology, and and I've got significant training in education and counseling psychology as well. So uh, to me, I look at it um, as, as forging community partnerships and uh, making sure that law enforcement, mental health professionals, addiction professionals, peers and their families uh, have the resources they need to, to, to meet crises that they may, uh, that they experience. And, and how do we keep folks from rotating into the criminal justice system uh, and instead to getting the help that they and their families need? Okay, wow, that's a lot. Thanks very much, Chief. We'll get back to that forging community partnerships, I think. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to ask some specific questions of each panelist that the League of Women Voters have put together. And um, so why don't we start with you, Kareem? Uh, can you tell us what the Governor's Police Reform Council is and how you're involved with that? So I'm the newest, one of the newest members uh, to the council. Uh, we've had our first meeting last week as an introductory. Um, so, I mean, pretty much it's, it's some brilliant minds, um, law enforcement, community, people, um, various organizations, um, some elected officials, and we pretty much are just trying to figure it out. It's, it's a rough time right now. Um, and the community wants to make sure the police are being not only trained properly, um, but are sensitive to what's happening around 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 the country. So again, I'm very new. Um, it's very exciting for me. Um, I really believe in the mental health training um, when it comes to police. I think it's very important to understand uh, what's happening with people mentally um, and having some empathy and sympathy uh, towards the people they serve. So again, this is all new for me, um, but it's a great opportunity. I'm looking forward really uh, to uh, making my imprint on the council. So is it mostly about putting together trainings or? It's trainings, hirings, it's uh, uh, revising how they're trained and the diversity in hiring, you know, the, the ratio between black officers versus white officers, you right. know, um, the term, the terms, you know, where they go from here. So, um, and, and the, the connection with the community um, is, is a really uh, strong part that we're looking at uh, as far as training. I, I, I imagine you're gonna get into, I know in Burlington, they were putting together, they're still gonna do it, I think, uh, more of a community oversight board. Is that, are you folks talking about, will you be talking about different oversight models? For yes, or? yes, there, there are a few com uh, committees already um, that is directly uh, gonna be geared towards um, community input. input. You know, uh, what, are, what is the community, asking for, what do we uh, want to see, um, again, at the pertains to trainings and how people are hired um, and, and really police brutality, you know, uh, 
Uh, th there are a lot of cases happening right now where it's unexplained. Um, you know, there's no positive feedback on how people are being, being treated. Um, so again, there is definitely a big component um, with the community. Absolutely. Okay. That sounds great. So could you just talk a little bit about what the role of peer support is within a, uh, you know, within a crisis intervention model? Um, oh, yes, yes. I, you know, peer support uh, it has been proven around the world to work. Um, peer support, if people don't know, are people with lived experience, people like myself who've experienced having traumas or challenging uh, times in their life and, and learned and lived and dealt with it, you know, and really going against a system that has been oppressing people um, with these stigmas attached to their names. So the peer support specialist or the person or even the organization is really focused on the connection, the relationship um, that we have with folks. A lot of times people don't want to talk to the clinical staff and to the hospitals mm -hmm. and the therapists. Sometimes they just want to talk to somebody who can just relate to their story, you know, and that's the power and the impact that a peer support uh, person has. Now, there's a lot of controversy around this topic, you know, a lot, a lot of the, the clinical field feel that um, peer support uh, people may not be qualified. Um, and again, we're not looking to diagnose or play a clinical role with people. Um, we just want to say, listen, we understand what you've gone, what you're going through. I've been there as well, and that's the impact. Um, but policing and peer support is a very sensitive uh, subject, and, I, and I, I think we'll get there later on in the conversation. Um, but everybody plays a role. The peer person plays a role. The clinical person also plays a role, and the officer also plays a role. So how do we find the balance? Okay. How, how do we how do we figure out where the balance lies and where everybody's input is valid? Okay, I was wondering. Uh, so I I read about that the, the trainings you do are uh, they're called intentional peer support training, and I'm wondering if that's the kind of same training that's uh, being done in other states. Is there a uh, a standard that's used, or do you? Yeah, just talk right. a little bit. So just to be clear, VPS does not, we don't do the trainings. We actually participate in the trainings. Okay. Um, I went through it myself. Uh, the Copeland Center um, handles that. Um, the but Copeland Center? I, yes, but I, but I will say I went through that training and it was, it was really good to hear from other people who are survivors, um, people who have made it through, you know, and to hear their stories and to really focus on how important it is to understand who you are as the person. You know, whether you're a peer person, a clinical person, or even an officer, who are you? What, 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 what about you connects you to helping and supporting people? Because when you lose that, you lose the work, you lose the magic, and that's where everything breaks down. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So um, <clears throat> I also read something about peer support workers. There's a, a, a movement or a trend to get them certified. It, what do you, you know, are, are, there, are they certified in Vermont or is there any interest in getting certification for specialists, uh, peer support specialists or peer support workers? Right, so that is a great question. Um, there, are, there are many organizations um, right now who are trying to develop um, that path yeah. um, to be certified. I mean, you know, I, I hate to say it, but you know, Vermont has not um, caught up to speed with other states as it pertains to peer support. Um, you know, there's not that much funding in peer support um, and the groups that are doing it, you know, we're doing the best we can, but the, 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 um, the support um, and the funding is really not there. Um, but yes, there are many organizations, you know, I see Kenneth there, you know, I, I, you know we have pathways, you know, you have different groups who are talking um, about how we can figure out how to get to that, you know? So I'm also yeah. part of that group. And the question is, do we need to be certified yeah. to, to say that we're relevant, you know? Does, that, that, does it matter? And that's part of the issue that peer people are not being looked at as relevant, okay? Mm -hmm. And that's a problem, you know, because I know the effect that I have when I sit on somebody's couch and I let them know I understand what you're going through because I've been there. Um, and again, the state is getting there, um, but they haven't arrived just right. Okay. Yeah, I was wondering, I was just uh, 
curious about that. So part of it is it's tied to funding, isn't it tied to? Uh, Absolutely. Medicine. And it's not a lot, it's not a lot of funding, you know, um, many, many peer organizations, you know, some are bigger, some are smaller, but we, we are all fighting the same fight, just trying to be recognized. And you know what, even my staff at VPS, you know, we're a small staff doing a lot of work, you know, we cover the, yeah. the whole entire state, you know, and it's yeah. under 10, 10 people of my staff, but we do what we can. You know, yeah. and we wake up every day looking to fit, especially right now. And it's very, very rough, challenging time during COVID. It's really hard to connect with people. So we've come up with creative ways. You know, we, we created a phone program. We actually have given tablets and iPads into oh. all the hospitals that we serve so we can be connected, you know, oh. just being creative. So, yeah, the funding is not there, but, you know, we're fighting the good fight. It's hopefully that things will change in the, in the, in the near future. Okay, very good. Well, thanks a lot, Karine. That really clarified some things for, you know, that I've been thinking about. Thank right. you. Thank you. So, um, AJ, I wanted to um, have some questions about uh, for D Disability Rights Vermont. So they do such great work in advocating and educating the public on what's happening or not happening in Vermont for people with disabilities. So I'm just gonna ask you a general question. What, what are your main concerns regarding policing when it involves uh, people with disabilities? Right, in Vermont. Yes, of course. Well, thank, thanks again for the opportunity. Um, we, we also litigate. I, I put in the chat box sort of a, a, a list of the things that Disability Rights Vermont does, and, and we do have a broad um, waterfront that we cover. Um, but I also uh, in the in the chat were some links to some documents that are relevant. Um, one is to a report we did uh, many years ago about the use of a taser on a, on a young on a young boy in his bathroom uh, in his underwear by state police. Um, that resulted in uh, a change of policy. Um, and I've also put a link in there um, to one of the new taser reports that is um, required to be filed by any police officer who draws a taser, uh, even if they don't use it. Um, and what's relevant and what's relevant about that and, and sort of how it fits in with my concerns about policing and people with disabilities is, you know, basically people with disabilities like most disenfranchised communities have a, a bad experience with policing. Uh, police often hurt um, our, our constituents and our, our friends and, and ourselves with disabilities. Um, and historically, they've done that. So um, sort of to cut to the chase, my biggest concern about policing and people with disabilities is that police um, interact with people with disabilities when there's no need for police to interact with people with disabilities. In my opinion, police are really good at preventing and investigating crimes. And um, and, and we need them to do that. Uh, but I have seen over the last 25 or 30 years of practicing law in Vermont that many times police interact with people with mental health disabilities when there isn't really a crime occurring or the crime that's occurring is so low level that it really would be better responded to in a therapeutic way. And so my biggest concern is that there's too much interaction with police and people who are not committing crimes. Um, and those people are often people with disabilities. And so um, we, should, we should work there. Um, people, um, when police do interact with people with disabilities, the law requires that they use reasonable accommodations, mm -hmm. um, reasonable accommodations. So it has to be reasonable. But, um, and so we're still working on, on all those issues, but you know, our concern is that people with disabilities get, get killed, um, they get traumatized, um, they get into coercive situations like being taken to jail or to the emergency department against their will, um, all unnecessarily because police are our main line of response. Um, and I think we should be moving towards a society where when you call for help, you, you don't get a police officer. You get, you get a person or a group that's really trained appropriately uh, to, to work with non-criminal uh, situations. So uh, we're working towards we're working towards that. I, I think that's answered your question. Yeah, it does. Um, but are there times when police involvement is critical and appropriate? Can you right, give so, an example? 
Right. I mean, so uh, at the Capitol building uh, uh, this week uh, or last week in, in D.C., the police were necessary. Right. Um, when um, a person is being beaten, you know, and don't forget that people with disabilities uh, are are more likely to be victims of crime than people without disabilities. And so we need police to stop uh, our people from being hurt. Um, and so uh, they're definitely necessary. Um, we like the police pulling over drunk drivers. We really need them to stop people from hurting other people. What we don't need police to do is to respond to emotional behavioral disturbances, community problems, poverty issues, mental health issues, uh, excuse the dogs, those kinds of things. So uh, I'm a big fan of police um, and, and um, I certainly want them to protect me when I need them, but I, but I think there's a limit to what they should be doing. And I think we ask them to do too much. I'd be interested to hear from Chief Pete, you know, what percentage of his calls from the Montpelier Police Department or from, from New Mexico, what percentage of those calls were really, you know, bad guys and bad girl calls, you know, mm -hmm. guns and abusive and what percent were not. And, and I think that's where there's a lot of room for improvement. Okay, great. Okay. And do you have any recommendations regarding training of officers as it relates to disability rights? So yeah, we, we could talk about that for hours. Um, I, I've been very fortunate to have been uh, working with the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council uh, for many years. Uh, years ago, we uh, many people on this call also work with them to create what's called the Act 80 training, which is police interacting with people with mental uh, uh, health conditions. We went through a long process to develop that training. We did surveys of consumers and families and law enforcement. Um, and um, you know what I've learned from that experience is that police have to be trained in things like empathy and um, civil rights history. Like the police have to be trained in the history of oppression of people with disabilities. You know, they, and they have to be trained in how to contact the right community services to help support the person who's, who's needing support. Um, those are all, and, and they need to be trained in the culture of people with disabilities. People, I think officers should volunteer uh, with, with um, organizations of people with disabilities, Green Mountain Self Advocates, Vermont Psychiatric Survivors, you know, spend time with folks with these disabilities um, and learn their culture so they're not so foreign. Um, so all those things are really important, but I don't think it's appropriate to ask police officers to be mental health workers or even social workers, um, because the coercion of a police officer is is not a, is not conducive to a therapeutic or a you know a, an uplifting relationship if you're in crisis. And so um, we can train the police a lot, and and the things I've just talked about are important training, but mostly we need to train them to know when to say, you know what, this isn't something for me, this is something for that group who's better trained and, and more appropriate. And of course, as a community, we have to have that capacity so that when the officer says, this really isn't a crime, this is really a social problem, we have the capacity to respond and we really mm -hmm. need to have that capacity a lot more. So that's, I'll stop there. Well, I guess I was thinking of also, uh... On, I have a nephew who has a learning um, disability and freezes when uh, he gets approached by authority. Um, he's dying to learn how to drive. And uh, my fear is that, you know, he gets stopped for whatever reason, he's going to freeze. He's not going to be able to communicate. And um, he's a big kid. And that would be perceived as being belligerent or, you know, miss, there'd be a miscommunication there between an officer and, and uh, my nephew and uh, may do something inappropriate, like reach for something, you know, and we've had the talk with him, he's Hispanic, but um, the onus, I believe, you know, and I've talked to Kareem about this, so it's really on the police officer. You're not, you don't want the police officer to be, um, a clinical social worker, or a psychiatric social worker, but at least recognize, well, okay, we've got a uh, something going on here, you know, that uh, the child or the or the adolescent is having trouble responding. You know, the, 
instead of like, all right, you're not saying, you know, get out of the car or whatever. And so I think their training is, you know, at least some disability training is definitely important, you know, in terms of recognition of there's so many, so many learning um, disabilities and things out there. And my, so, I worry, I worry for my nephew. I really do. So. Well, you know, I know that when I get pulled over by the police um, and, and I'm stone cold sober and I don't have a significant uh, mental illness or developmental disability, I freak out, right? My, I, no. I, and I'm nervous um, and, and I'm not doing anything wrong. Uh, so it is, it is very scary. A, a good place to look um, for this training is the new use of force policy that um, I try to provide to folks. Uh, I think you can get it on the state police website. There's a new draft. And we've we sent some comments about that. So did the ACLU. Um, that new use of force policy might be a really good tool to, to protect against that fear of police brutality for people with disabilities, because it's going to we're hoping it's going to require police to really consider disability before they use force. Um, right now, the draft policy asserts that well, the the law does not require special treatment of people with disabilities when they're being arrested. And we've pushed back on that in our comments, asserting that clearly the law does require that as long as it's reasonable. Um, and with the new, um, the objective reasonable force as opposed to just sort of the off, there's a, a change in the law that just happened um, that I'm sure uh, Chief Pete might be able to talk even more about, mm -hmm. but that should have a big impact on decreasing the use of force against all people, universal precautions, but especially against um, uh, disenfranchised populations. Well, yeah, I think that's a great example of a universal precaution right there is, is that would be that change. Yeah, definitely. Well, great. Thanks a lot, AJ. I appreciate this. Um, so Chief Pete, um, I understand you were recently appointed to the board of directors with the Crisis Intervention Team International. I want to congratulate you on that. Thank you. Um, and so for our listeners, we have provided a link in the chat for the CIT International Guide to Best Practices in Mental Health Crisis Response. If you want to check it out, it's in the, it's in the chat. Uh, and there are a lot of models there that are being used across the United States for, um, for crisis response and crisis um, intervention. <clears throat> so, Chief uh, Pete, what are, I, I guess my first question is, what are the guiding principles when it comes to developing a crisis intervention team program in, in a community? Uh, well, the, the guiding principles would just pretty much be to, um, to stand up, um, a, a, to have a CIT strategic advisory committee, to stand up a, a, a program group that will um, bring together all stakeholders, which include police, mental health uh, professionals, uh, as I previously mentioned, peers, uh, members of their family, um, and, uh, legislators, everyone to, to come in to, to, to create a model that will meet the unique and the specific needs of a given community or, or a given state. Uh, and then, to, uh, then, then from there, uh, guide um, responses, again, uh, in, in the interest of safety to uh, the peer, but is uh, the, the uh, whoever's experiencing the mental health crisis, but uh, safety to the officers as well, with the intent of of, of guide, guidance towards resources and guidance away from a criminal justice system. So it, it's been long realized within um, law enforcement circles that a, a, as funding and budgets are cut, um, and and fewer and fewer resources become available, especially in social services, those tasks by default tend to fall to law enforcement. And, and I agree with a lot of it. And, and a lot of us within the profession also agree that it's not the, the place for us to be. Um, so I, I don't think there's a significant amount of pushback in law enforcement to look at other models and how we can respond to that. But, but we do need to be trained and we do need to have an awareness and understanding of what mental health crisis is and what we're looking at if we experience it. Because in, in reality, if, if, there, if someone's going through a mental health crisis um, and say even if they're with, there have been times that I've gotten calls that 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 particular person is getting treatment is, is with their respective social worker, psychologist or psychiatrist. 
they're calling us if there's a significant uh, event and, and, and our responsibility, we need to understand and know what the crisis is, what it looks like and how to de-escalate it. So, so um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very intricate and complicated process, but it takes, it takes all of us to figure out a solution uh, with the best intent for uh, the, the individual and the family who are dealing with the crisis. So I, I was thinking more like uh, one of the, that that's good, that falls on my other question, but I was thinking more of like general tenants, like um, reducing harm and, and trauma during the intervention or um, engaging a person in their own care. Um, I was thinking about that. Are you, I think you're, Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, it, it was. It, I, I was having a little bit of technical difficulty. So it, you're talking about just prim primarily the what what the principles and the best practices for CIT look like? The, yeah, like the principles behind your programming, like reducing harm when the interact when you're doing an interaction. The, the guiding principle yep. being reducing harm and trauma during that interaction. And yeah. And so, so Yes. Yeah, so no, no, the guiding principles are ultimately the safety of the person in crisis and the officers and everyone who's involved. That's how everything came to be and understanding like uh, the CIT was based off the Memphis model, which is the first um, that related to, a, to an unfortunate tragic incident and when law enforcement responds to somebody in crisis. So, so the, the goal is ultimately safety and doing that and, and to, to, under, to have that safety, we need an understanding of knowing what it is, what mental health crisis looks like knowing what the elements are, knowing what, know, knowing what, um, uh, yeah, just what it looks like in general. Okay. So it sounds like the goals and the guiding principles are kind of, uh, are synergistic, synergistic. So, uh, so one of the things, I don't know if it came from where I saw this, but they talked about transforming the crisis response system to minimize the time, the number of times that law enforcement officers are the first responders to individuals in emotional distress. Does that, I mean, I read that. I think it came from, um, I'm trying to think where it came from. Does that, I, I think I read it in, in um, the uh, CIT international guide to, uh, to best practices, but um, do you, do you agree Agree with that? I mean, I think is that a goal that is consistent? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I think that, that 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 there are several goals, and again, ultimately, they to me the goals are are are. are depend on, on on the desires and the unique needs of the given community um, that's going to implement a CIT program, uh, what those priorities and the focus agendas are. Um, I, I think that, uh, yeah, yeah, it, it, is, it is definitely that. It, and, 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 and with that, to me, it would be getting folks the resources and access to the resources that are going to help them throughout the crisis, uh, to me, you know, for that response. Okay. So can you talk about the components of a integrated crisis response system? You know, uh, you know, like, you know what I'm talking about, uh, emergency, for instance, an emergency 911, first contacting the crisis line for a mental health uh, crisis in, instead of the police. Can you talk about the components of a response Yes, so, so so those components would be um, looking at helplines, looking at peer agency lines, working with partnerships, and and trying to have somewhat of a flow chart, if you will, uh, and, and triaging those calls and making sure that you know criteria based dispatching to understand to ask as many questions as possible to know what we're dealing with and seeing if we can can utilize other resources other than law enforcement to handle the situation. A huge part of this is also a public educational component because sometimes folks are still calling 911 by default. Other times there may be an incident that, you know, it, it may be a call for 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 a, a particular disturbance of you know maybe a, a traffic accident or or anything of a light that would normally seem quote unquote routine. But upon arrival, the officers may realize that there is a mental health component to the case. So a, a lot of times it's it's uh, it's 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 not as easy to ascertain what type of call we're going to until we get there, until we can assess the situation. Okay, 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 okay. Um, so what, since we're, we've, uh, we've kind of arrived here, so I guess um, one of the things we're interested in is, is that there are, you know, there are a few crisis intervention models in use in different states right now. Um, do you think one model is better than the other? For instance, 
um, thinking about first on the scene, peer support workers first on the scene versus our a team made up of a social worker and a, and a, a policeman on the scene or uh, a mobile crisis service consisting of a team of mental health professionals on the scene. Is there a yeah, no, I'm sorry. Personally, what I advocated for when I was in Alamogordo was to have a mobile crisis response unit. And that was that was a it was a team of, of mental health professionals uh, and other relevant stakeholders to respond to calls that we we were pretty sure or that based on the call that came into dispatch, we, we believed had a mental health uh, component to it. Um, in those in those teams, sometimes officers are embedded in those teams and those officers have a softer appearance that they're not coming in uniform. They're not coming with lights flashing everything to that effect to potentially escalate the the situation, uh, but they may be there in a safety component. So if it's a if it's a call that 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 there that there is you know a, a consideration for safety for those who are going to respond, that that embedded officer can can help maintain that safety. But that person is also highly trained in ways not to escalate and ways to understand what the crisis looks like. Uh, so prefer personally, that's my preference. But I think ultimately it depends on the unique needs and the focus um, and the priorities of any given community. Now. Um, would they come, that sounds an awful lot like the CAHOOTS crisis assistance helping out on the streets model in Oregon, but uh, I'm not sure they have an embedded policeman there though, but um, do they come in a van or do they come? Well, I think it depends on the resources. It depends on the on, on the resources ultimately. So cahoots is separate from the police department, but they work in partnership. And to me, one of the one of the one of the the, the interesting things about how cahoots got its name, to my understanding, is when they came into being, and because they did have a, of a working uh, professional relationship with the police department, there were a lot of people who advocated that you guys are in cahoots with the police department. So one of the things that I, as I understand the name is, uh, so it's it's almost, so in some cases, it's a darn if you do, darn if you don't. Um, but ultimately, I think that, that the, the focus is, you know, and I don't want to dissuade anyone's experiences, um, but I think the focus is everyone involved uh, uh, in giving the benefit of the doubt and my experiences and what I've been doing since I've been in CIT was with the ultimate goal of helping people and not doing any harm to the situation. Uh, so so um, we just have to make sure that we um, that we find those mutual ways to, to bring about these changes and to, to, to bring this about as we move forward. Okay. And uh, just a little different question is that one of the league members was interested in was uh, what is the best practice to ensure accountability regarding the consistent use of appropriate policing procedures? That's uh, a loaded question, I know. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess it depends on the specific incident of what we're dealing with. Um, I think the accountability is there. To me, when we talk about things like like police accountability, we, we talk about transparency and that the police... Uh, and previous things, especially now what we're seeing is, uh, is we need to do more to, to, to get the trust of the public to, to, to rebuild our legitimacy um, and, and to reimmerse ourselves within the community. It, it starts with making sure that we're transparent in everything that we do, that we put information out there, maximum information, minimum delay. That, that's the only way that we're going to gain that trust, that we're going to get that trust back. And, uh, and, and so, so as far as accountability is concerned, we have to make sure that um, that we're answerable to the public. And, uh, and for those departments that aren't, um, well, you know, that, that's the way of the dinosaur for anybody who has that ancient way of policing and thinking. Um, um, so yeah, when, when I joined the police department and, and uh, what motivated me to get to where I am now is to make sure that we're doing positive changes moving forward. Um, I, was, I was not a police officer all my life. I've experienced other things. My family has experienced other things. People that I know and love, friends and family have experienced a lot of different things. So I think to change any organization, we, uh, we, we do it from the inside and every organization has its challenges. Um, um, so it, it, it's, it's not just particularly our, our, our profession, although we do have to answer to the sense of what we've done. Okay. All right. Um, I think that's, that's what I, that's all I have right now. Um, well, I guess the last question I have is, do you know what direction the city of Montpelier will be moving in, in terms of, or what's being, what's the model, what's the 
approach right now? Is it, do you have a policeman that if somebody's in crisis, or you know what what is the approach being used right now? So, so currently the uh, the city of Montpelier has team two training. So there's mandatory statewide training in mental health um, to understand to look at you know to like a. a to understand just an immersion of, of what mental health looks like. Um, and, but there's also team two training, which goes beyond that. Uh, to me, I don't think it's enough. Um, that team two training is, is an eight hour training. Me personally, I'd like to bring in CIT. I plan on bringing it to my department and I plan on trying to bring it uh, uh, as a statewide program as it, it, it itself. So um, that's, um, that's something I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to and hoping to, and, and the appetite for, for, for those suggestions uh, within the law enforcement community is, is pretty strong. So I'm, 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 I'm hoping for and very confident here within the next year or so. Um, it definitely, you will see it for the city of Montpelier, um, but hopefully we can also introduce a, a citywide um, or a statewide CIT program. Yeah, that sounds good. I'm, you know, I'm curious, I'd be interested in seeing what, I imagine there are videos out there of police training dealing with people with uh, who are in crises or disabilities, and I'm, um, there are videos, training videos, right? I mean, I know, I know that there are for judges. I mean, judges, how not to judge, how how not to get, <laughs> how not to to get off the bench and and chase somebody out of the 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 courtroom. So there must be those kind of. I I think that would be one step toward transparency to make. Those kind of training videos available for people to see. What? Yeah, and, and you make a good point, Judge. I think that uh, uh, one one of the most powerful things um, with CIT training, CIT training is uh, is forty hours, um, and uh, and and one of the most powerful things that it is is uh, is interaction with with peers. It's interaction with <laughs> their family members, and 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 it's actually. Uh, personal conversations and horror stories, if you will, of how someone may have had a negative interaction with, with police and what that did uh, for them, how that made them feel and what that did going forward for their family. Um, and and, and th those are extremely powerful, very deep conversations. And they, and they, they reemphasize humanity. They reemphasize that police officers are for the community. They should be embedded in the communities that they're sworn to protect. Um, and, and it really hits back home. So uh, th th it's, a, it's a very good training. It's one of the best trainings I've had throughout my law enforcement career. And, uh, and, and yes, ma'am, th there are lead by examples uh, with, that, with that training and lessons learned. Okay, that sounds great. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, uh, Chief Pete. So we're at um, 10 of eight, we're moving right along here. And I guess it's, uh, I'll take a few listener questions that are up on the chat and some are directed to certain people and some aren't, but um, I'll make a guess at who should answer them perhaps, if you allow me that. Um, so the first question I have in the chat that I see here is, my understanding is that the Montpelier Police Department has a shared part-time mental health professional working with the department. How does that job function? And is that person available for consultation or being present when the department is engaged in an urgent or emergency situation with a person with mental illness? Absolutely. It's a very, very good question. And uh, so on, it, it's one of those things that we, again, with resources. So uh, we are in partnership with Barry City and with um, Washington County Mental Health Services. So we, um, so, so that social worker is part time, if you will. She spends half of our time here and half of the other time in Barry, and that's due to restrictive budgeting. Um, but um, she is, she is tremendous. And, and uh, she, she comes out, she rides out with us. Uh, we do proactive work here in Montpelier. So if, if, if we've dealt with someone who may have been experiencing mental health crisis or um, uh, who, who may have issues, uh, she will go knock on a door and, and she'll knock on the door and ask, you know, 
hey, I know that you've had this problem or you might have any difficulties, what type of resources, and she'll speak and work with families. Uh, she'll assist us on calls for service as well. But we try to mainly, uh, and, and, and she connects in within resources. And because she's embedded with Washington County Mental Health Services, she has a, a, a plethora of, 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 of access to information to help people who are uh, uh, dealing with mental health crisis. So it's, it's, it's been very good, uh, I'm, I'm, but I'm hoping that uh, we, we, can, we can up that a notch uh, as we move forward. Okay, and I think it, the question goes on, how does this work when the department is on duty 24 seven, but one part-time person clearly can't be? It's it's difficult, and and it's not only that. If even if we did have a twenty four seven, that's why I like the mobile crisis response model. Um, but even if we didn't have, we have to look at resources also for, like say for example, Washington County Mental Health Services, because they're not a twenty four seven operation, for the most part. So it's uh, it's 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 it, again that boils back down to what happens at 11 o'clock or two o'clock in the morning when someone is experiencing a mental health crisis, who has to respond to that particular situation? So it's, it's you know, police need to be trained to understand what they're dealing with, but we also have to look at the opportunities and the resources that are available to help us with this. Um, it's, again, this is something that, that we want to make sure that we get it right. This is something that we wanna make sure we're helping and not hurting the situation. Okay, so where is that funding coming from? Is that from your budget or from mental yeah, health? It, it comes out of our budget, one third from us, one third from Barry, and then uh, then some from Washington County Mental Health Services. Okay, okay, okay. That's what I was wondering. Uh, thank you. Yes, um, another question from the email is: What is the best role for peer support or counselors in responding to mental health crises where police are called in? And this is for Kareem. Yeah, so um, so peer support should be everywhere, for one. Um, just to kind of talk into what uh, Chief Pete was saying, I think part of the issue is that it is too normal that people initially decide to call the police when it when it, as it pertains to mental health subjects and issues. I think that that, that the reeducation to the community that peer support is another way, an effective way of how people are, be, are being helped today, right? And peer support, not only is it effective, people are not used to it, okay? And it's been around for a very, very long time. You know, it, it's, it's, a, it's controversy right now, even about the funding and that the money didn't go to the peer organizations, you know? And that goes back to what I said earlier about the state has not caught up to speed to understand that peer support is a very effective tool to help people. Now, I understand the police department and the clinicians have their roles and I totally get it, but I, I, we're definitely missing the mark and not looking at what peer support does, okay? So to answer your question, peer support should be everywhere. We should be funded properly. We should not be you know, looking for crumbs to help people. Because you know what? People are, are traumatized. People don't want to go to the police for the most part. People don't want to go to the hospitals. People don't want to sit and speak to clinicians. Now, I'm, this, this is no, no, no shot or shame toward any of these professions. What I'm saying is that the state is not paying attention to the work of the peer world, right? So I hope that answered the question, but we should be everywhere, okay? We, we should not be embedded in every police department, you know, they play a role, we play a role, okay? So I hope that answered the question for the person that sent that out. It, yep. it, 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 I'm sorry, Judge, if I may quickly piggyback on that, I agree sure, wholeheartedly sure. with everything that he said. Peers are, peers make the difference in any program, in any program, and they are, they are, they are fundamental. And, and I argue that, that they are most effective than, than even in, in a lot of cases, the social worker or the person who's giving treatment. Um, um, so I, I agree a wholeheartedly, 100% with what Kareem is saying. Well, if I could just weigh in real briefly, uh, yeah. the, we, we issued a report recently called Wrongly Confined. You can see it on our mm -hmm. website, it be in the chat. And it, and it goes to the issue of um, Vermont has historically not funded community supports sufficiently to prevent unnecessary coercive interactions. And so um, when 
police do want to call in peer support or when people do want to call an alternative to the police, those resources don't exist in most corners of Vermont most of the time. And so our report, Wrongly Conf Conf uh, Confined, is a call to our state government and policymakers to put a lot more money into peer supports, community mental health supports, housing, jobs, uh, mentorships, healthcare, so that people are not so stressed out and they have other options than to wait to get to crisis and then call the police. And, and you know what? And, and, and I have to say, to me, it makes no sense that uh, certain agencies have millions of dollars um, to do some work for people, right? And if there's so few that have a peer support program, okay? And I, I know of one uh, in Rutland, but throughout the whole state, the, the, these, the hospitals are getting all this funding and people are revolving in and out of these hospitals, not getting adequate help. But you know what they get when they go in? They may get a diagnosis. They might get told, you know, you, you should go talk to somebody, but there's nothing happening. And you know what? That person leaves, they come in on Friday and they come back on Sunday. And then they come back and I, I can, let me tell you, the system has so much way to go. It's, 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 it's kind of sad. I know there are, there are a lot of, um, some of our elected officials trying, you know, and I, I'm working with a lot of them, but again, we have a long way to go. And, you know, until the state understands the power of peer support, it's gonna always be the same thing. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think this is a good, um... Uh, entree into um, AJ, what you were you talk, we were you know emailing about with that report that recently came out, the Armstead uh, uh, initiative. Could you just quickly uh, talk yeah. about that? What's happening on that end of on, on the uh, uh, institutional end of uh, you know um, mental health uh, treatment and what happens once they do get moved from crisis to treatment. Well, I just sort of echo what, what Kareem had said, which is that a, a, a lot of people wind up being hospitalized for mental health problems unnecessarily because the community supports weren't there. And then when they get moved out, they, they have really not developed the kind of relationships they need in the community to stay strong and, and they have a revolving door. So, um, there is a concern among advocates um, and, and, um, and lawyers in Vermont that the state of Vermont is, is more focused on building locked facilities than they are in providing appropriate community supports, peer supports, and the things I talked about earlier that you can find in the report. For instance, um, the, the state is committed to trying to build another 25 inpatient hospital psychiatric beds uh, in Berlin, that, that plan is off the table for the moment, but that is in the long-term plan, um, rather than really flood the field with um, housing and peer supports and respite and employment supports um, and, and jobs um, that would help uh, alleviate the need for these coercive um, events. Um, similarly, the state is, is planning on spending $6 million or so to build a six bed locked facility for boys to replace Woodside, even though there really hasn't been a kid locked up uh, like that for months. Um, and so the question is, why are we building more very expensive locked facilities like psychiatric hospitals and secure facilities for, for boys with emotional disturbance problems when all the evidence is that if we work with these folks upstream and we strengthen the community, um, that we can avoid a lot of these problems. So there is a law that the judge talked about, the Olmstead law, which is part of the ADA, which says that states have a responsibility to provide services to people with disabilities in the least restrictive setting. Um, there are a flurry of lawsuits around the country right now, including two in New Hampshire that got filed this week against the state of New Hampshire for the state not organizing itself appropriately to prevent people from being put in jail because they were arrested or put in the hospital because they didn't have the right care. Um, Vermont has similar problems and frankly is exposed to similar liability. Um, 
because as you'll see in our report, our government has known for years that we're not funding the community adequately, and yet they haven't taken reasonable steps to, to respond. They do a little bit here and there, uh, but it's not enough. And so our goal is to, again, use the right tool to address people's suffering. Um, and sometimes that tool is not a police officer with a gun. Sometimes it's a peer support worker with, you know, with a place to live, a respite house, and maybe an opportunity to get some job training or, or you know, become a peer coach themselves. So, we, you know, there are times when there, we need police to stop bad guys and bad gals. And there are times when we need, you know, doctors to fix serious, severe, life-threatening medical problems. Um, but we're using those heavy duty tools way too often to our detriment, both in terms of blood and treasure. Um, and so that's sort of our, our position. And we're gonna be working with the legislature uh, to increase community supports and decrease locked facilities going forward. Oh, that's, that's excellent. I know that when I read the report, it's rather disturbing how people are stuck in psychiatric units because there's not enough resources for them. That they're way beyond, you know, they've got their treatment, they're ready to go, but there's no place for them to go. So they're in a restricted lock setting for ridiculous amounts of time because there's no place for them. There are not enough community resources for them, not enough beds for them to to get back into the community. And that was pretty, that was pretty disturbing to read that. So it's yeah. So that's great. I I, I like the um I like where um, Vermont Disabilities is going with with focusing on yeah, advocating for more community resources and services. That's great. So another question we got here is um, what is happening and what is going to happen to get serious collaboration between Washington County Mental Health and the Mount, Pe Mount Pelier Police Department so we don't have another incident like the killing of Mark Johnson where was his Washington County mental health case manager during this crisis? Why were the police there, but not the mental health crisis worker? Where was team two, which was on the front page of the Times Argus days before the killing? Um, anybody, they don't designate who they want to answer this. Um, this was this before your time, um, Chief Pete, probably. Uh, yes, Judge, it, it was before my time. Um, uh, uh, the only thing I could comment on is what I understand happened at the case, um, th that this was an incident that occurred at night. This was an incident that occurred that when uh, Washington County Mental Health Services is closed, um, other law enforcement agencies to come to, to come by to, to potentially help us were closed. Um, uh, so it's, 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 it's it's a very tragic and sad situation. Um, uh, and uh, so I, I think that what we, you know, it, I, I can't answer that question. I, I honestly can't answer that question. All I could say is that going forward, um, we have to do what we can um, to make sure uh, jointly, um, jointly and that the police can't be all the they can't be the catch-all that that uh that the resources are out there to help families and people in the crisis the direct resources um and that we move forward responsibly and trying to figure out ways what the gaps in our treatment and, and, and our response models are uh so um and so someone just put put something on here that white washington county mental health uh is on call 24 7 yes they are but part of the policy is if we don't know this is a mental health crisis that's going on and the calls that come in are of an individual who is trying to break into an apartment building and unfortunately it's brandishing a weapon that the officers uh at the officers that that is going to change the policy and the response model for any social worker or any counselor or anyone else that's going to move forward um so no mr johnson was not the incident did not happen in the morning it happened at night on a midnight shift so uh, so I, I we want to i don't think any officer wants to wake up and be involved into a situation like that i didn't join the police to have something like that or to 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 to, to experience something like that um so i i think that you know we just have to 
figure out where our gaps are, where we can be stronger at. And those conversations are going to take all of us because all of us hold a certain piece to that, to that puzzle to bring about ultimately what's best for the person in crisis and for their family. Okay, thank you, Chief. Um, AJ, do you wanna weigh in on that case or on? You know, I, I'd be happy to have Susan Lemire who uh, wants to talk about that. Um, she's the crisis worker. Um, you know, all I'll say about that is, is um, no doubt it was tragic and no doubt we have to do better because because even though Mark had this pellet gun, he was a known person in the community was not going to hurt anyone. And it was a it was a it was a mistake. And while we have to protect officers, um, we also have to make sure that officers don't kill people um, unnecessarily. And and in 2020 hindsight, this was unnecessary. While you're in the in the moment, um, you know, officers have to protect themselves. But again, um, we didn't have the right response, uh, perhaps. And if we had layers of response, it might be different. But again, I'm very interested in what Susan has to say. Hi, everyone. So I actually came tonight as a um, sort of a fly on the wall. I wanted to hear what people had to say rather than be part of the discussion. So I wasn't planning to, to talk. Um, but I am the embedded clinician who is part-time with Montpelier and Barry City and also um, works for Washington County Mental Health. And so I just wanted to clear up a couple of things, starting though by clarifying that I was not um, around during the incident that is being asked about specifically. So I wanna broaden the, the discussion. Um, Washington County Mental Health has screeners 24 seven. Um, however, there are two of them on a shift and it does occasionally happen that you have two screeners and both are tied up. Um, you know, screeners are screening people that are in the emergency department um, and in their homes and sometimes at schools and a variety of places. And so um, I am aware that there are times when, you know, an emergency is happening and sometimes a response isn't instant because it can't be. Um, in terms of the piece though, um, I guess backing up, one of the reasons that I wanted to come here and do this job is I worked for 20 plus years in mental health, some of that time in crisis services where we worked parallel to the police, but not really in close collaboration. And um, that was too bad. That was a loss. I really felt like there was so much overlap in what we did that we could all do what we did better if we were working in collaboration. When I learned about this position and I came out and interviewed, I found out that Washington County Mental Health has had a longstanding and very unusual relationship with Barry City Police Department and Montpelier Police Department where there is frequent um, communication and relying on one another in collaboration, uh, the team two trainings together. Um, and that was one of the things that drew me to this position. Um, I guess after saying that I wasn't going to speak about the, the one incident in question, I do wanna say that doing my research before I took this job, um, I did learn about that incident and um, I learned that there was footage and I wanted to take a look at it because I wanted to feel confident about the decision that I was making. And I have to say, honestly, I don't know that if I had been on the scene, that there was something that I could have tried that would have had a different effect. Part of what I'm saying is that I saw many attempts to de-escalate, to connect with the person, to emphasize, you know, we want to help, how can we be helpful? Um, and I, honestly, it was very moving to me to see that. And so I just want to say that piece. Um, a last thing <laughs> that, that I wanted to mention is that when we talk about calls that go to police, it sounds almost as if people are calling and saying, I have a mental health crisis at such and such address, please send someone and, and police are deciding that they are the people to go. 
Um, many times when calls come through, you know, I've been in the dispatch area where calls are coming through and all you hear is screaming and, bang and banging. Um, and it's clear that something's going on and that someone's in distress. Um, and beyond that, it's not so clear. So, um, you know, I, I love what I do. I also have great respect for what police do. And I have seen some amazing social work-like um, interventions coming from law enforcement in the time that I've been here. So. I just wanted to throw that in. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. That's very helpful. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay. Um, moving on, I wanted, I have another question here. Um, ask Chief Pete about Montpelier's Police Review Committee. Chief, could you tell us yes. about this? Okay, so w w when I first arrived here, one of the things, especially in light of what we were, um, what we were experiencing as an institution, um, was uh, again was, was a, a, a heavy focus on police accountability and transparency. Uh, so I came in, I did a, a, an initial strategic assessment. That information is out, and I also saw something that came across the chat box um, th that you you could Google that footage. Uh, it's actually, I believe, it's on YouTube, but that you could Google that footage, um, and and then uh, that so that 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 body camera information or, or footage was released um, but one of one of the one of the things that I recommended for us was a, was was a police advisory committee to help us look at our strategic goals and inputs and the council uh, implemented that and right so currently we do have a police review committee that is looking at our department our policies procedures uh, and, and, and any potential trends um, and then going forward hopefully to, to find ways to help us reimmerse ourselves within the community um, I think that we already have a very strong relationship with our community uh, as a whole um, uh, so but we're, we're looking for ways on how we can how we can continue to bridge the gap and forge stronger relationships uh, so so yeah it was it was something that our department asked for and something that uh, our city council responded to and then that we're all moving forward because again I, I don't look at this as an island as far as I can only speak for the Montpelier Police Department um, but uh, we, we believe in 21st century policing. I believe in 21st century policing. I believe in transparency and accountability. And I'm gonna bring that here to this department. And, and I was fortunate enough in coming here that I think that the culture here, the existing culture here is based on 21st century policing uh, technology uh, uh, practices. So we're just gonna, we're gonna move life speed into the next realm. We're gonna find ways that we're gonna continue to partner with our community and be part of our community and not absent from it. Okay. Who's on that review committee? Do you have a community members, I assume, or? Yes, they're all community members. The, the, the board was selected uh, based on uh, folks who had volunteered and they sent information up to the city council. The city council reviewed them uh, and then they made the decision, uh, it was free from us. They, they made their decisions and who they were going to appoint to the committee. And I believe that the committee is looking for folks who are uh, for additional uh, uh, two people, maybe. So, if anyone has an interest in uh, in, in being part of that committee um, and, and working with the Montpelier Police Department, I encourage you to reach out to Alyssa Sherwin, um, to reach out to Mary Smith with the uh, at the the City Hall here in Montpelier, and and uh, find out how you can submit that information. I don't have it with me right now, but uh, you can definitely submit that information, and and we welcome you aboard because we want to to be with our community as we look forward and and how we're going to uh, do policing. Are those public meetings or are they, how are they, in how many times them, uh, do they meet uh, quarterly or monthly or around a crisis? How, how does that work? No, those, those are those meetings are open to the public. So uh, again, on the city's website, you can look under the uh, the agenda in the minutes, um, and and they're, they're they're listed right there with the um, with the homelessness task force, with city council meetings, and, and everything else to the extent. Um, and so anyone can can zoom in, and they can do those. And I believe they're roughly two times a month, maybe the the most recent one I think was 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 this Monday, was this past Monday. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's good to know. I also wanted to just mention that um, up, uh, a link we put up was the Vermont Mental Health Crisis Response Commission, which is a 2019 report to the Governor and General Assembly, Chief Justice, Supreme Court. Um, and it's pretty much uh, uh, it's 
focused on the uh, March 2016 death of Phil Grenion um, up there. I think he he resided up in the Burlington area, and that's available as uh, as a link. And in there are recommendations for all sectors that of uh, providers that were in, involved, including um, law enforcement and housing, um, all the needs that a really good solid um, list of recommendations worth looking at. So I wanted to share that with you. Um, so I'm, I'm looking, Michelle, I don't know if you're still there, but I'm looking for other questions. And some of the ones I see, I we've already answered. Um, there was one I think that uh, would be directed at Kareem, which was, um, what kind of training do peer support folks get for crisis intervention? Yeah. So the, the easy uh, response to that, um, we get multiple trainings, um, but one of the most effective trainings that we get is understanding again, who we are, how, how are we connected to this work? Um, what tools that can we use to make us a better listener, a better understander, a better person who can identify you know, how do you identify? So the trainings vary. Um, I, again, I, I uh, went through the IPS training. It was very helpful. Um, uh, the team was very skilled in what they did. Um, but again, I will say as many, and not to go back and forth, but as many police that we graduate uh, at the academy, I think it should be a peer person as well. I think, I think that same focus and energy should be geared towards hiring people with lived experience um, that can do the work. And I will always say, everybody plays a role. I worked on the crisis team in Rutland Mental Health. I worked yeah. alongside of, of with clinicians, you know? I've also worked aside with police and helped. Everybody, once again, plays a role. But again, when you, when you take one role, the peer support role, and you, you 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 dilute it um, to say things like you know they're not clinically trained so how could they be helpful? You're already thinking the wrong way. You you already left field. So again, I can't stress enough on on this this uh, this event here that believe in what the peer support work does and what it produces. Understand the power of it. Understand the power of people's story and people's testimonies and how that that can be the key. For me, I'm a, I'm a young black male from New York City that went through a lot. That because his father was killed by police, I was very angry at police. But if it wasn't for a peer person, a person that kind of has some of that lived experience and that can sit me down and, and say, listen, there's, there's a better way. And there's, there's a bit better way to handle your life. That meant everything to me. So once again, you know, I mean, I guess I was brought here to, to talk about, you know, part of my, my story and, and, and what the peer support work does for the, the city of Vermont. Uh, again, just, and I, I know there's a lot of familiar faces here and people who I've worked with before, um, you know, but police, they're humans as well. I have friends today who are police and they're human as well, but I, the approach has to be done very differently today. The approach of how we approach people with mental illnesses, it can't be an authoritarian. It can't, we can't stand with our chests poked out because people respond to that. People who have, who hear voices or people who, who see things. When they see a person standing in front of one of this, this stance and I am who I am and you need to listen to me, that is a trigger. That would make most people in that state of mind react in a way that is, you can't understand if you don't understand. Mm -hmm. So once again, we have to figure out the balance of what the police role is, what the peer support person is, and what the clinical staff does. And again, the peer support is very effective and it's been proven around the world. Thank you, Kareem. Um, I was uh, on your website. Perhaps you could just give your quickly your website um, address. And I saw that you have you put out a... Um, newsletter it's it's quite comprehensive it's quite a few pages and i i learned more Absolutely. about your organization going through yeah, that yeah. newsletter yeah. Vermont psychiatric survivors.org um 
we have counterpoint yes that is our newspaper that we publish and there's a whole bunch of information there we highlight uh issues that are happening around the state um you know co coercion issues we have some great testimonies we have stories about people who are actually saying that i'm surviving today you know because we don't always want to talk about all the gloom and doomy things we want to talk about some success stories and how people who are who have challenges are surviving today you know so yes please look at the time go to counterpoint we have given out i think about five thousand copies uh throughout the state uh within the past two or three weeks so yes you can go on our website look at that we have a facebook page that we are upgrading currently but yes please when you get a chance check out counterpoint you have you can see the staff the support groups that we support and even if you have a story a survival story that we want to highlight let us know okay sounds great no it's a really great newsletter i was very impressed with that and um i hope people get a chance to look at that uh, i don't see any more questions i, here. I want to acknowledge jean she's uh okay, jean. forgive me i'm going to try to compress your comments into what i think you're getting at which is um why don't we review all crisis situations as a psychiatric nurse uh, for many years the debrief is where strides are made. And I know you had an earlier comment about that as well, about um, negative um, feedback being processed. But um, so there's there's a there's a question there about debriefing. Debriefing, okay. So who would, uh, who well, would wanna I was, grab that? Yeah. <laughs> so, so Jean, you know, Jean, um, who is a psychiatric nurse apparently, probably has sort of the best understanding of debriefing um, from a from a medical point of view, and what she said in the chat is that um, the best strides forward in improving practice are often made after a crisis incident when everyone involves debriefs. Um, from the mental health uh, clinical side and the, the federal regulatory side, uh, debriefing is required in psychiatric facilities um, after events. But what's really important about the debriefing that's required by the Fed is that it has to include the person who was the subject of the crisis. Um, you have to get the patient's perspective because the staff really have to learn from the patient what was going on in their world so that the staff cannot have that trigger happen again. So it's not about making the patient conform to the staff's ideas of what's needed. It's about understanding what's going on with the patient and adopting for that. That's going to be harder with police because I don't know whether the defendant is going to be that um, available to debrief. And so that is sort of a problem when police debrief among themselves, they don't have the perspective of sort of the most important voice in the room, the person who was the subject of the use of force. Um, and so that might be an area to, to work on, to improve, to, to try and bring subjects in for, the, for debrief. If, if I may judge, uh, if I can also, um, I, I, I think uh, I think counsel's uh, straight on on point, um, and uh, and and there there's a saying in, in NAMI. There's a saying in the mental health area. There's a saying with peers. There's no conversations about us without us, and 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 if we're serious about tackling this problem, we're not playing sandbox. We're not playing. We're the police. We're going to handle it. We're not playing uh, 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 any of that. None of us should be. The, the goal is help. The goal is to get people and their families the help and the resources they need. And 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 Kareem, buddy, I'm telling you, man. I mean, you're you're pretty powerful. And uh, and I'm looking forward to working with you, with 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 AJ, and moving forward and figuring out how we're going to bring this change and how we're going to step Vermont um, into where we need to be and how we offer people help. It's it, it, and and I'm, I'm extremely appreciative to Susan too because mental health is extraordinarily a, a personal to me as well. I got family members, personal issues that, that I'm dealing with, crisis times that I've been there too. And, and, uh, and, and I've seen how not only law enforcement or the judicial system itself, but even in, in how some of the, the systems that are designed to help people who are in crisis have failed them. So it, there's, there's work that all of us need to do. There's a lot of work to go around, and 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 I'm pretty sure, and I'm very confident that that that, that the people are here. People want to get the work done, and we need to get together and do the work. Period. 
So thank you all very much for reigniting my passions again. Um, and, 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 and I'm looking forward to, to being arm in arm with you as we move forward and trying to figure this out. Thank you, Chief. I think Vermont, if any place, if you can't try something creative and innovative in Vermont, which is a small population of people and uh, small, you know, small villages. I mean, I, I just think if you can't do it, try something, uh, a pilot program. I mean, are creative in Vermont. You can't do it anywhere. And um, yeah. so I'm, I'm really, ex you know, excited about about that, too. So um, I think that's it for questions. And I think uh, we're at the end of our event. And I wanna thank our panelists tonight, Kareem Chapman and AJ Rubin and Chief Brian Pete. And so, you know, I learned a lot about mental health issues in Vermont and look forward to future public discussions on as I said, innovative policies and programs that could be implemented on the community level, on the community level, not um, as we learned money going into more restricted settings and, and you know, going, going back to institutionalization to deal, but more peer support, more, uh, more models that are really uh, community focused, community level local communities. So I want to thank Michelle Singer of the Kellogg Hubble Library and the League of Women Voters for co-sponsoring this event. I hope everybody stays safe out there and good night. Thank you very much. Bye, Bye everybody. Thank you all. Bye everyone. Thank you for the opportunity. Bye. Thank you. God bless. Thank God you. Bless. Thanks.